you look at one area of mathematics and you see something coming up from another area, seemingly unrelated. I take a brief moment to appreciate what our brain did. Our brain is a very interesting machine. We just processed infinite number of operations in the split of a second. Hello students, I hope you are doing beautiful mathematics. In this particular video, we will talk about one of the most beautiful ideas in elementary mathematics. It was first time discovered around 1500s. But after that, with the help of Leonard Euler, Cauchy and Poker and other mathematicians, this idea flowered into the domains of modern mathematics. Uh, but the fundamental idea is very simple. I want to share with you that. And it is an example of something called an invariant principle. This is in geometry. This idea from geometry is beautifully interlinked with number theory. So it's like my, one of my favorite ways of learning mathematics. You look at one area of mathematics and you see something coming up from another area, seemingly unrelated, and uh, wonders happen. Okay. This is good for uh, people preparing for mathematical Olympiads uh, because it is also an application of number theory in geometry. And also a very good example for invariance, which is also a tool for problem solving. So the real question is this. Suppose you have a polyhedra. In this case, I have drawn a tetrahedron. If I draw another polyhedra, let's say I draw a cube. It's also a three-dimensional solid. In fact, it is a convex solid. So what is a convex solid? The idea of convexity has uh, different meanings in different levels of mathematics. If you think about it in terms of a plain sheet of paper, a convex polygon, maybe this is a convex polygon, as opposed to a concave polygon, is one where all the angles are a 180 degrees or less. That's a elementary geometry definition. So I'll draw a concave polygon. So here is a concave polygon. So this angle here is more than 180 degree. But there is a more fundamental way of talking about convexity. So if you, in, in a convex figure, it could be a two-dimensional figure. It could be a three-dimensional figure, even an n-dimensional figure. What you do is you take any two points, let's say A, B, and if you join them by a straight line, the entirety of that straight line will be contained inside the figure. Just like in this picture. I took to any two points A and B, I joined them with a straight line. The entire straight line is inside the figure. This will happen for any pair of points that I pick from this polygon. Therefore, it's, an, it's a convex polygon. But... In this other concave polygon, this will not happen. So if I take this point A and if I take this point B, if I join it, that particular line segment, partly this part is outside the polygon. So this is not a convex polygon anymore. It's a concave polygon. I'll take a brief moment to appreciate what our brain did. Our brain is a very interesting machine. We just processed infinite number of operations in the split of a second. What is the infinite number of operations? See, I, I could have taken A and B here. Then this segment would be totally inside the con this particular polygon. And I might have concluded, oh, this is perhaps not, perhaps not a concave polygon. It's probably a convex polygon. So... But no, I went here, I took A and B here, and I sort of checked all other possibilities in my brain in a split of a second, and I chose the points here, and I saw that it's not working. So it's very interesting how our brain works. So the same thing is true about polyhedra, three-dimensional figures, all right? So 
The question really is this, if you have a polyhedra, be it a tetrahedron, be it a uh, cube, is there anything that is not changing even if you change the polyhedra? Something that is not changing if you, even if you change the polyhedra. And this is the remarkable discovery of, I, it's not of Euler, it's someone before Euler actually knew about this and published results on it. Uh, the discovery is this, that if you calculate the number of vertices, so here there are four vertices in the tetrahedra. If you subtract the number of edges, so you see one, two, three, four, five, six edges. And if you add the number of faces, number of faces for a tetrahedron is four, tetra is four. Then you get the same number every time. So for tetrahedra, you see what happened. Four minus six plus four is two. You will get the same thing for a cube. So let's do it for a cube. If you have V, the number of vertices is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the number of vertices is 8. Number of edges. So you have 4 at the top, 4 at the bottom, and 4 edges standing. So 12. So minus 12. Plus faces, number of faces. So cube. It has one, two, three, four, five, six faces. So eight minus twelve plus six, that's again fourteen minus twelve, which is two. Remarkable, isn't it? Number of vertices, number of the minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is always, always two. This particular number or formula is sometimes known as the Euler's polyhedral formula. Okay. So this says something very interesting about the three-dimensional space. In a later part of mathematics, when Poincaré would come and other algebraic uh, topologists would come, this would be known as the Betty number. They worked with higher order stuff and they discovered this sort of more fundamental result about Betty numbers. You can Google that if you are interested. Euler was sort of the first person to see it for in general for all convex polyhedras. Therefore, the formula is uh, named after him. But I don't think he com published a complete proof at all. The question is, how can you prove this? How can you prove that this happens? And how can you show that there are only five regular solids Using number theory, number theory, and Euler's formula. So first you have to believe the formula. First you have to prove the formula. And just using this particular formula, this particular result, and using some number theory, you can show that there are only five regular solids in the three-dimensional world. It's kind of interesting how numbers govern the geometry around us. So for this, I will actually suggest a book to you, how five regular solids, there are only five regular solids, because I think the book does a majestic treatment of this problem. So I, I want to give you this suggestion because it will be really helpful for your own growth as well. It's called Excursion into mathematics. So this is not excursion in mathematics. That's a different book, much thinner book. Excursions into mathematics. That's a different book. It's a. It's kind of like this thick, and it's a very beautiful type uh, exposition on different parts of mathematics. This one is one one of those expositions. So you should definitely try that out. But let's let me just come back to the main formula one form for a second, and let's talk about. Another solid, which is the octahedron. Here we go. The octahedron, which is an eight-faced solid. Here we go. And if I draw it like this, calculate the number of vertices, the number of edges, and number of faces, and see 
if that V minus E plus F, that thing still comes to plus 2. So how do we go about proving this? Can you find some other solids where this works? So I'll briefly give you the sort of the sketch of the proof. It's say it's done using triangulation. First, you do it for two-dimensional graphs, and then you sort of go into three dimensions. The two-dimensional graph proof is like this: that suppose if you have a two-dimensional polygon, then V minus E plus F, F in this case are the enclosed areas, is always one. This is one dimension less. You are now in two dimension. It's a plane. So you can check. It says A, B, C, D. Number of vertices is four. Number of edges is also four. Number of face is one. In this case, this enclosed space is the face. The question is, how can you actually prove that this will always be the case if we take a convex graph? So there is a certain special kind of graph where this works. So how do you show that is like this. You first triangulate and then you de-triangulate. And the claim is that this is possible for any convex polygon. So you just join, you just split everything into triangular pieces. Notice that if you do that, for example, if I did that, I increased an edge, but I also increased a face. So they will cancel off. This will minus one and plus one will cancel off. I increased one edge, but I also increased the face. They will cancel off. So whatever V minus E plus F was, by increasing that edge, I did not change that. Because I just whenever I increased an edge, I increased a face as well. So that's called triangulation. So you split the entire thing into small, small triangles. And then you do detriangulation. How do you do it? Whatever you do, what you do is you just remove one edge at a time. If you, you remove one edge at a time and you correspondingly remove the face that it is attached to, if it is attached to a face. So for example, in the first stage, if I remove CD, if I remove CD, so then the number of edges goes down by one, edges go down by one, but then the number of faces also go down by one. Because I removed the face, this enclosed face, because that's not there anymore. I've removed the edge. So now the picture looks like this. Since one edge gets reduced and one face gets reduced, V minus E plus F, whatever was there, it stays as it is. Now I remove a vertex, but then I will remove the hanging vertex. Then I'll also remove this edge, the edge to which the vertex is hanging too. So again, I reduce the number of vertices by one, but I also reduce the number of edges by one. So V minus E plus F remains constant. Now I'm left out with only one triangle and you can check that for the triangle, V minus E plus F is always one. Three vertices, three edges, one face. V minus E plus F is always one. So that's how you do it for two dimensional case. And for the three dimensional case, what you do is you project it on the plane. Once you project it, it becomes a two-dimensional figure and you can do the same exercise. I would strongly suggest that you go to excursions in mathematics, into mathematics, and look up this particular chapter. It's a beautiful, beautiful learning experience. You will learn a lot and you will see how invariance works in geometry and number theory. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. All the best. Bye.